Hello and welcome to uh, look back at the first uh, 11 stages of the Tour de France. We're starting with the prologue, uh, the Lyon uh, contre la montre individual, the first man off with Laurent Fignon. Laurent Fignon coming into good form, having won a final stage in the Tour Aprilia's in Italy, was not going to finish in the top 30. Fignon sporting some very unusual handlebars, an unusual saddle as well to streamline the air behind him. Another man, though, who's not going to finish in the top 30, in fact, 57th, was Rooks, riding in the national champion's jersey of Holland. He just won that the Sunday before the Tour de France finished. Next to go was Brunil. He was also out of luck, and up there in the top right-hand corner, Greg Lemon was waiting for his turn to go. The riders were starting at... Uh, Minute intervals along this short course of 5.4 kilometres, and all eyes were on Terry Marie, who was setting a fat pace. Bunyo was also going well, but uh, not going to finish in the top 20 either. Bunyo also wearing the national champions jersey of Italy. He won that the uh, week before the tour started, and one of the hot tips for the tour this year. Another hot tip for the tour this year was Delgado. He had missed out in the uh, Tour of Spain deliberately to try and do well in the Tour this year. And unlike a couple of years ago, when he was over two minutes late to the start, when he forgot his watch, he was able to finish in fine start, uh, style this time, but was still outside the top 25 riders. The fast men were beginning to come into the finish. This is Alcala. Finished 23rd, just some 15 seconds down on Terry Marie. Marie had already posted an extremely fast time of 6 minutes 11 seconds and the rest of the riders were battling to try and beat it. Kiopucci, always a punchy rider having a go. He was to finish 22nd overall, 15 seconds down. Same time as Alcala but split by tenths. Kiopucci, winning this year at Milan San Remo, had come into this race prepared to attack everything and everybody. But it was not his style to go time trolling on the prologue at a great rate of knots. He was followed then by Van Hoindonk. Hammering in to finish in uh, 12th place, just some 13 seconds down. And Hoydonk, winner of the Tour of Flanders, was enjoying the sunshine. Also enjoying the sunshine and smiling there on his way through then for the Alios Deer team was Goltz. As an amateur, he'd uh, taken medals as a pursuiter on the track. And he was his short distance suiting Rolf Goltz. He was to finish uh, 11th. Jean-Francois Bernard received a tremendous round of applause from all the people. He was coming back and riding for the Bonesto squad and had found some good form. He finished, in fact, in ninth place, ten seconds down. Yakimov, the World Pursuit champion and holder of 11 amateur world records, was in good form, but he could only finish in eighth spot, ten seconds behind. Still, Marie's time looked good. Indoran, a very good time trial as well, much preferring the somewhat longer distance, though, was really riding on to finish in his low-profile bicycle in fine style. Indoran was going to finish seventh at nine seconds as Jelly Nidham of the Buckler squad that pounded in to push him down by one mere slender second. Nidham was going to hit sixth spot at eight seconds down. He was followed by Maori, the winner of the Tour of Spain. Maori was to finish fifth, eight seconds down. Now the man who was second in the World Pursuit Championship. Moro riding for Tonton Tapis. Here he's riding in to finish in fourth place, just seven seconds down. A good performance of Tonton Tapis to start in the prologue of this, the 1991 Tour de France. But Greg Lamont wearing the yellow jersey, last man off along the route, and we're running them back in reverse order the way they finish now, because Lamont was to finish third at three seconds. That's the highest up any race finish he's had so far this season. He'd just come into good form. He wasn't going to take this one. Just three seconds back gave him third place. So the yellow jersey was going to go off the shoulders of Greg Lamont, last year's winner and triple winner of the Tour de France. Eric Brokink, a noted time trialist, was doing what he could, but he was going to come down the finishing straight, just look at the clock and see that in the end he was going to fail to beat Marie. He was going to finish in second place by two seconds. 
And this is the man that they had to beat, the man who set the fastest star. We're looking back at his action now, and a brilliant performance by Marie, winner last year of the prologue time trial. He makes a speciality of this one, does Terry Marie, bouncing on in to take the fastest time and with it the yellow jersey. Terry Murray knocking up his 42nd victory of his career. A specialist in prologue time trials, already won the prologue in the mini-libre this year. He took the opening prologue in this year's Tour de France. And the yellow jersey that goes with it. No stranger, as I said last year, he did the same thing as well. Well, that's it. We're going to take a short break. That is a position. Murray in the lead. Six minutes, 11 seconds was his time. The first full road stage of the race uh, was from Lyon to Lyon, 114 and a half kilometers. This was a circuitous route, was going to take in two fourth category climbs and two special sprints along the way. There were time bonuses of these special sprints of six, four and two seconds. And at the end of the stage, there'll be bonuses as well of 20, 12 and eight. So as would be expected at the early start of the race, those few vital seconds might be to an advantage. But as an early escaper, and off he went, Ralph Yarman, who went away. Yarman going for long one, catching the rest of the field, napping. Nobody wished really to chase him down. On the front, the uh, Wyman uh, Eddie Merckx team were constantly watching, and in the midst of the main pack, Kravsold touched the wheel and crashed. The Z rider really brought down with a bang and was very terribly hurt. <laughs> Kravsol, a team member of the Z squad that has Greg Lamont as its leader, was an already an early casualty. This is quite typical on the tour stages, the early start, when you have 198 riders, all of them packed closely together. Except for this man, Rolf Yarman, still on his way into finish. But he's being fast chased down by a bunch of riders, and in fact his action has split the field. Ten men came up to join him. These ten men coming up to join uh, him in the lead were Raul Alcala, Bruno Cornelay, Eric Brooking, Gilles de Lyon, Rolf Sorenson, Michel Vermote, Rudy Darlins, Greg Lemond, Sean Kelly, and Jamali W. Japroff. That's Lemond wearing number one, and this is Ralph Yarman, and they soon then had 11 men, 10 plus one, heading on down in towards the finish. Already some of these top riders were beginning to be a threat to the rest of the field. They gained well over one minute, and heading in towards the finish, they were still advancing even more so. Le Mans urging them on. It was an opportunity which they just could not resist. The special sprints along the route were quite useful, and it was Abdul Japarov who was leading out Le Monde on that one. Abdul Japarov from Le Monde and Sorensen in the pack there in third spot. The field behind suddenly became concerned. The gap was growing all the time, and with Le Monde in that pack, with the only the few seconds separating most of the contenders in the time trial, then it meant they had to do some serious racing to try and cut the gap back. Benesto particularly were worried. They hadn't got a man in that break. Carrera were trying to interfere with affairs because they had got a man in the break, Abdul Japarov. And still the 11 men coming in towards the finish in Lyon were well clear. Greg Lemond getting an update on the possession, told to persist with that break. Lemond was in magnificent form. He came into the tour, he timed as ever his uh, fitness exactly right. And he was racing like we'd not seen him at the early part of this year. Le Monde was in with a vengeance. Another sprint coming up uh, for the PMU sprint, and again, some more vital seconds available. And Greg Le Monde is going for this one. Le Monde recognising he must scoop up every second that he can do to take that yellow jersey, if a possible, has gone across the line ahead of Sorensen. And looking over his shoulder in third place, Breukink. And still Le Monde. Closing up on the finish with Brokink on his wheel. Yarman in those start all in third space. Rudy Darlins in the World Championship jersey towards the back. Alcala sitting in the back too. 
Breaking leading over. Coming in towards the finish, the sprinters begin to lick the lips and Darnan saw a chance to try and win a stage. He went for a long one, the rest of the pack closed up. Off the back and out of contention was Cornelay. But up in the front, it was going to be on the left-hand side, the career rider, Dejamin Apujaparov, who went for it. Kelly was on his wheel on the right-hand side, but on the line, it was Apujaparov from Sean Kelly. And in third place, amazingly, Greg LeMond, getting some more vital seconds bonus. Kelly, uh, Kelly in second spot, and what a familiar sight here, though, to see Le Mans wearing number one in his Z jersey, but not going to last for long because everybody's anxiously looking at the time to see what he'd done because with all those seconds bonus, undoubtedly he was going to take the lead. The main pack came thundering in, led across the line by Jean-Paul Van Poppel of the PDM squad, beating Johan Muzio, Carlo Bermans, and Etienne Deville in the sprint. So Greg Le Mans got back the yellow jersey. This was after the 114-kilometre road stage. But in the afternoon, there was a team time trial. This was 36.5 kilometres from Lyon to Chassieux, where the Euro Export is going to be held. The team's setting off uh, in reverse order, and an early good performance was set by the class squad. They posed an extremely good time and were going to be in the lead for a long time to come. But then PDM set about their work. And PDM, a noted time trial team, but in fact they were only going to finish fourth and they were going to be two minutes down on the overall victors. Panasonic trying to repeat what they did last year. They won last year's team time trial. They won it in 88 as well. Only Kassarama had performed the sandwich by uh, finishing first the team time trial in 89. Panasonic make a speciality of this one, but they were going to finish third overall at 1 minute 45 seconds, and a disappointment to all concerned. Castorama, who won the team time trial in 89 in Luxembourg, were going very well indeed. In fact, they were going to finish in, 20, in second place just 24 seconds down. An extremely well-dilled squad and going extremely competently in this 36.5-kilometre uh, race. But the fastest time on all the checks are being set by the Adel Steer squad here in the red and yellow with the triathlon style handlebars, which do make it rather difficult to corner. And bang, crash, down they went, and one of the men that came off was Rolf Sorensen. The time is taken on the fifth rider to finish, and providing the rest of them finished close upon their fifth man, then they were going to be credited with the same time. Further on down and back at the, at the start, Tonton Tapis was setting off minus one man. They were going to actually finish last in the time of two minutes, 13, uh, two hours, 13 minutes and 27 seconds. The one that was missing is Stephen Roche. Roche was suddenly found. He'd been in the toilets, and although they put a call out on the public address system, he hadn't heard it. He thought the team was starting at 22 minutes past four. They, in fact, start at 10 minutes past four. He was already something like five minutes behind, and they weren't going to let him start. He forced his way through the crowd and set off to ride a lonely time trial to try and stay within the time limit, much to the consternation of the officials who didn't want him to start at all. Roche, who performed that triple, only one with Eddie Merckx ever to win the Tour of uh, Italy, the Tour of France and the World Championship, was not going to finish in time, and in fact he was eliminated. Ralph Sorensen it was that took the yellow jersey as a virtue of the wonderful performance by the Adar Steer squad, and that confirms it that Sorensen was in the lead by 10 seconds from Greg LeMond. Join us after this break. Eurosport, the Tour de France. Welcome back to the third stage, covered 210 uh, kilometres from uh, Villeurbanne to Dijon. The sun was beating down, it was going to be an extremely hot day for the riders as they set off. Le Monde wearing the green jersey as points leader because the yellow was safely now on the shoulders of uh, Sorensen. And there was Kravsol with the injury to his arm, and in fact uh, it was going to be extremely sore. These crashes not unknown in the early part of the Tour de France. And it's a beautiful countryside, but it wasn't long before the action started to happen. Duke Ossel having a little bit of a giggle there. Duke Ossel, winner of the Midi Libra, chatting to Guido Bontempi, two of what I might call the grand old men of the Tour de France. But it wasn't long before the action started, and a big sprint then for those few vital seconds bonus. And on the line then, as they went across there, there was Ludwig and Abdul Japrov batting it out, and that was the finished him. 
No time for the riders to admire the scenery. Beautiful countryside, though, heading out west towards Normandy and eventually out towards Brittany. This was the way that the tour was going this year in a anti-clockwise direction with the first 11 stages pretty flat and not the mountains in sight until stage 12. It was an opportunity for the sprinters or the roadmen to try and show their paces. Sammy Marils decided to take off. And he was caught up by Ruth Cabastani, Jesper Skibby. Jesper Skibby there in the TVM colours, another man who likes to go for a long break and hopefully to win a stage. But the pack were not going to let them get too far away. And the Arasir team did the chasing down. Their job was to protect the yellow jersey of Ralph Sorensen. But still the break persisted. Skibby going through. The lotto rider behind him, Sammy Morils, and the rest of the pack swinging round the beautiful central reservation here. A lot of congestion as the riders begin to bump shoulders, and they're going to reel in these three escapers. Slight slope had the rider in view, and it's an easy time for them to jump across. Heading under the five kilometre to go banner, yet again more attacks. This time, Downers is trying to go for it. Rudy Downers recognised that he had to go for a long one. And uh, Bugno, looking over his shoulder, could see that the bunch was coming up. Downers had been caught. Bugno had gone across to join Downers and pressed on with his advantage. Downers back in the main pack, Bugno trying to go away on his own, but Bugno was caught moving up there through the top of your screen. And Etienne de Ville chose the time to chop inside the Wyman uh, Eddie Merckx rider and go for a long one. There was 1,500 kilometres to the finish and he got a long way to go. Out the saddle, this man was really hammering down in towards the finish. Etienne de Ville looking for a stage victory in the tour, the rest of the pack trying to catch him back. De Ville still going for it. He won a stage two years ago in the Tour de France and this was going to be another one to add to his collection of victories. De Vilde on the line. Just behind him was Van Poppel, Ludwig, the Japarov and Muzio. De Vilde taking the flowers of victory and the congratulations of the crowd. The Arrow Steer team had done a good job to defend the lead of Rolf Sorensen. Sorensen still in the lead, just some uh, 10 seconds from Le Mans. There's confirmation of the placings on the line. Van Poppel leading the charge behind him, and Ludwig and Japroff and Muzio and Jalabur, all top sprinters, being pushed out by that fine ride by De Vilder. Moving on then from the stage to Dijon to Reims, this was 286 kilometres, the longest one in the race. Time for a bit of a stripping off, because underneath the jerseys, some of these riders prefer to have some wool to keep warm, but today the temperature's soaring up above the 25 degrees, and you can see the shimmering heat now, and the riders beginning to dehydrate under these conditions. 286 kilometres in all, heading up to the Champagne country, Dijon to Reims. Claudio Chiapucci, always active and always keen, in fact, to try and uh, activate the bunch, was beginning to show at the front. Nobody really wanted to get that man to go too far away because last year he was one of the four men that broke away on stage one and proceeded to take over the yellow jersey and didn't lose it until there were two stages to go. Chiapucci had with him uh, Jerome Simon, the clerk, and Crabiolet. The rest of the field set off in hot pursuit. And through his magnificent champagne arch, the tour went its way. Accompanied this time by a ride on horseback. Fortunately, the rider had the horse in good control. Horse had been known to bolt into fields before now and bring down riders, but he was enjoying his day out, and so the riders were enjoying it as well. But fortunately, despite the attentions of the two horse riders, they kept them well into control, and these three men in front pressed on with their advantage. Tibaldi, Van Etebeck and Nielands were three men who stole away on the rolling roads with the rest of the field not too keen to chase them down. That's Van Etebeck wearing the national colours as a champion of Belgium. Heading on down in towards the finish at uh, Reims, all the escapers were beginning to be hauled in. There was no way anybody was going to save away from this pack today. Still persisting with their break, but uh, they had now been caught, and another one went away. Fondriest and uh, Bugno decided to try their hand at, at breaking away. 
on the long straight road heading in towards uh, Reims. The field could see the three men up in front, sorry, the two men up in front, and we're going to pull them back. Abu Jafarov, sensing that possibly he might be in with another stage victory, was really going for all the bonus he could do along the way. This would help him move up the general classification bit by bit. And with the escapers back inside the peloton, they were now setting up for a sprint finish. And as they started to go, Brian Holmes went into the lead, whistling round the corner, but his Abdul Jafarov had a superb lead out, thundering across the line, and as he went up towards the finish, Muzio tried to go on the inside. Abdul Jafarov did a typical sprinter's tactics, took him into the barriers, but Abdul Jafarov still managed to go upright and stay upright, Muzio being pushed back to sixth spot on the sprint, then Abdul Jafarov uh, from uh, Ludwig, Kelly, Skur and Rab with Muzio back in sixth. Looking that one in slow motion again, in the middle of the pack and way back off the field there, we can just see the yellow jersey as they hit the line now. Abdul Jafarov going for the line, just taking it ahead of Ludwig. So yet another victory then for Abdul Jafarov, still in the green jersey and still in the yellow jersey, Rolf Sorensen. Confirmation of that sprint with all the top sprinters throwing themselves at the line. Their confirmation also of the general classifications. We take time out now for a short break. Do join us later. Eurosport. Welcome back then to this, the fifth stage, as we look back at the racing in the Tour de France to date. The fifth stage taking the riders from uh, Reims to Valenciennes, there in the yellow jersey, Ralf Sorensen. It's going to be an eventful day for him. There are 149.5 kilometres to be covered. And in the sprints early on, Ralf Sorensen decided to help himself to a few bonus points as well. The rest of the field coming up to them, and again, attacks were going thick and fast. This one was by Soren Lilholt. Then Mark Maddio had a go as well. There were plenty of opportunity for riders to go and attack on this stage, a short one, and every opportunity perhaps also for the pack along the route to be cheered on by massive spectators. They were getting thicker as the race went on. More and more out to see these riders on their own, but they were not going to last very long. Again, another breakaway group started to go for it. The gap now was at one minute, and this was a useful group of riders. In this group, Willems, Marc Mario de Klerk, uh, Kiefel and Chauzas. Chauzas there from the Anse team, stage winner last year in the Tour de France. Ron Kiefel has done extremely well, finishing on the second and third in stages, but uh, hasn't got himself a stage victory in the Tour de France yet. So, over the line then, taking that with de Klerk. For the bonuses, just ahead of Ron Kiefel. The bunch for now were not too bothered. None of the boys in front represented much danger to the overall uh, yellow jersey of Rolf Sorensen. There's still some way to go. <laughs> Trying on his own then was the King of the Mountains to see if he could collect some more points. It wasn't going to be too hilly in the early part of the race, but the clerk was after everything that was going. But the field soon pulled him back. There's no way one man on his own can stay out for that length of time. Now eight men started to go clear. This was a jolly useful bunch of riders because in here was uh, De Wolf, a very strong man indeed. Fondris was in this one as well. This looked like an extremely useful break. The rest of the field thought they'd better pull them back. Because in there, Ludwig, De Wolf, Vichot and Le Marchand were very strong indeed. And as soon as they got caught, Giannetti was also trying to get away. Giannetti then and De Wolf began to split the field, and off they went on their own. Behind them, Chiapucci was always active. And up they came, together with Fondrest. They joined up with the two leaders. And Amaya also putting a man up in that little break. Montoya it was, with Fondrest here in the red, yellow and blue colours of the Panasonic squad. Giannetti, who was very active early on, and Tonton Tapis rider, Dirk de Wolf. 
Oops, and there as Greg LeMond's team beginning to move forward and pushing and shoving their way through, led by Duca La Salle. They wanted to pull back this breakaway because they were getting dangerously in the lead, particularly with Fondrias and Kirpucci. They just did not want them to gain any time. So going in towards the finish, it was Nydam that went for a long one. Lydam caught them all napping a thousand kilometres uh, out from the finish. And there he went down the finishing straight. The bunch was closing up on him fast. He looked back over his shoulders. The time that he gained was suddenly disappearing as Nydam went for the line. The big pack falling on behind him. As they hit the line, it was Olaf Ludwig that was pushed back into third place by Stumpf, getting one of the best successes of his career. So Nydam went across the line first, then Stumpf, then Ludwig and Caps. But consternation in the crowds they came in. There have been several crashes on the way in towards the finish. And one rider that had been brought down was Rolf Sorensen, the yellow jersey. He staggered in some 13 seconds down, and whilst the podium was up there, the celebrations for Nydam going on, Little did they know the drama behind with the crash to Sorensen. Nydam then winner of the stage, ahead of Stumpf, Ludwig, Kappas, Yakimov, Muzia and Redan, but the pushing and shoving in the final five kilometres had its effect. Sorensen managed to get in, but could not go up on the victory rostrum to take his yellow jersey. Le Mans was at nine seconds, Kelly menacingly at third in ten seconds back, breaking at 16 seconds fourth. The next stage from Aras to Laad, the sixth stage in the race. It started without the yellow jersey. Unfortunately, Sorensen, although overnight there was some talk about him starting in the morning, he did not sign on. So technically, the yellow jersey was on the shoulders of Greg LeMond, a young rider who decided to take part in the proceedings as well. No doubt enjoying this moment of glory until the gendarmes found him out and quietly took him to the side of the road, felt his collar and took his name and address. Nope, they just decided his little lads had his fun and it was time for him to go off. And all the field, being very happy with that, waving goodbye. That young man will no doubt remember for many years. Here, Greg LeMond in the Z colours did not take the yellow jersey. And that has happened before in the tour, when through sickness or illness or crashing, when the yellow jersey has been out, then the, the next man in line has sometimes been known not to take the yellow jersey. But Thierry Marie had no time for the conversation behind and set off. It was a long way to have. They were coming 259 kilometres today, and uh, Marie decided that he would go for a long one. The rest of the field, in the hot sunshine, decided that they'd let him go on. Jerry Marie had gone away with just some 52 kilometres of the race covered. There was still a long way to the finish. And on the road from Aras to Rahav, the undulations heading into Normandy, and that man on his rally bike here was showing a determined style. Back in the bunch, no one was concerned. One man on his own, there was no threat really to a fast-moving bunch. But today the bunch was not moving that fast, and Marie at one time was getting a lead, which was increasing all the time. As he went further and further forward, there was a bit of attention to the gears here, but uh, Marie at one time had a 21-minute lead, and there a new innovation in the Tour de France, sticking the number back on again. Because this year, instead of the numbers being pinned on by safety pins, they've got uh, numbers that can be stuck on the back of the rider's jersey. And obviously there, one had fallen off and was being replaced. The rider number 101, Gilles de Lyon. Still, Terry Marie pressed on. His lead, which at one time was 21 minutes after some 130 kilometres had been covered, was beginning to shrink. It was then down to 15 minutes, 135 kilometres on his own, and he began to sing a song about Normandy. Just proving you have to be mad to ride a bike. And little did he know how mad he was, because in fact he set off on what was going to prove to be the second longest break in the history of the Tour de France. The rest of the field decided they'd better try and pull him back. There was a crash in the field, and the motorcycle went straight off into the public as well. And there was all sorts of consternation as Brian Holm came down there, uh, together with Serge Demier and Robert Miller. The Glaswegian was in all sorts of trouble, the motorbike was on its side as well. But the field got down some serious chasing. Greg LeMond leading much of the action. Because at one time, Terry Marie had been overall race leader on the road. Because they'd gone into that stage, and Marie still well placed after his, after his good time trial performance. The technicality was that Marie could take the yellow jersey. They had to do something about it. Marie was beginning to suffer on his way in towards La Havre. But still he stuck at his task. Terry Marie 
going in towards the finish, already in the prologue time trial, had won that one and taken the yellow jersey. Now he'd lost the yellow jersey, Gap was coming down. His Castorama teammates did a wonderful job blocking. But as it came in towards the finish, it really was a magnificent effort. 234 kilometres on his own. And the big bunch came into sight just one minute and 54 seconds down behind him. This time, Stumpf got his revenge over Abdul Japarov, threw his bike at the line, but it was another second place for Remy Stump. Abdul Japarov relegated to third spot. Kelly was fourth, De Vilder fifth, and a smiling Teddy Marie was up there on the victory rostrum. Second longest stage break in the history of the Tour de France. The previous one had been held by Albert Boulon. Well, sadness here on the face of the man who, because of the cracked uh, shoulder of the blade and his collarbone broken, was not able to take the start and lost the yellow jersey. Rolf Sorensen out of the race. This man, leader on the World Cup, has now gone off to hospital. He's had an operation and looks forward to be back in action in time for the Wincanton Classic in Britain in just a couple of weeks' time. Confirmation then of that victory for Thierry Marie. Stump, Abdul Jafflov, Kerry Deville, Jalaba and Muzio behind. Great ride then by the man who... Uh, Eurosport. The Tour de France. This bro the La Half uh, stays to Ardentan was due to cover 167 kilometres. And in fact, uh, Terry Marie's effort was sufficient to get him the yellow jersey. Congratulations all round on that lone break, setting all sorts of records. He's back in yellow again, Greg Lamont having given it up. So the field then going across the bridge here. Uh, to Tuka down and down on the crosswind went uh, Para. Fabio Para fetched down by a serious burst of the crosswind and he was to break three ribs in the accident. So Para was out of the race. His teammates had looked back to see if he could be of any help to him, but it was not to be so. Para was out and there's a great disappointment for the Amaya team. Fabio Parra had come into this one because of his strong climbing and they were looking for a victory from this man up there in the Pyrenees. Jakobs came up uh, to Abdul Japarov to explain to him what had actually happened to Parra further back down the field. But this is what bike racing is all about. Narrow streets cause congestion for the riders when you've still got something like about 190 riders filtering their way through. But still the crowd were out to see these giants of the road, and Robert Miller was still in great heart of great pain from his crash yesterday. He was riding with a neck brace on, enough uh, bandage on his arm to stock a hospital. Greg LeMond's team were in all sorts of trouble. They'd already had a crash, and now Robert Miller was struggling as well. So the attacks were coming on this first the sprint. Cravelay just got ahead of De Klerk. Cravelay in the RMO colours, De Klerk in the jersey of the leader on the King of the Mountains. Another sprint this time was contested by Abdul Japarov, keen to get the six seconds bonus. And he did it in fine style, sho shoving Muzio back into second place with Jalaba in third. Golds was off on his own. He decided to go for a long one as well. Rolf Goltz then, winner of the Tour of Ireland just about three years ago, was in fine form this year. And Goltz was trying to win himself a stage. Ariaste having had the misfortune to have lost Sorensen, but there's no time for him to admire the scenery as Goltz pressed on towards the finish. The rest of the pack then going through the feeding zone, helping themselves to food on this stage of some 167 kilometres. Still, Galtz persisted with his attack. The sun was beating down, it was extremely hot, and the peloton weren't too keen to chase, but the action was going to come. Fignon and the Castorama team had got to pull him back because, again, at one point, Rolf Galtz was technically race leader on the road. Not had too good a year so far, fourth in the Tour of Flanders, but last year he had five wins. Past winner, the Ruta del Sol and the Tour de Haute-Var. This man was looking for an opportunity of taking a stage victory. 
He'd also won a stage in 1987 and a stage in 88. He'd like a third one to add to it. But there was help coming up from behind. Galt soon had some extra riders with him. By now, they were beginning to press on towards the finish. Castorama still having to do the chasing because their man was in the yellow jersey. But Lotto decided it's time that they should have a go as well. Shows us and Pedersen had joined up with the one rider on his own and a bigger group had come as well. Banitabek easing his way past the rider from the Wyman team as the rest of the pack came up to them. Abdul Jafarov as well, starting to go for it with one kilometre left. Kelly looking up over the shoulders, they're sweeping round in towards the finish. And yet again, we had a fearsome sprint, but this time Van Poppel hammered across the front, leaving them all as if they were stuck in the tarmac. Van Poppel of PDM had plenty of time to throw his arms up in the air and take the victory. Congratulations to all and sundry, except the pack behind was still thundering up, led over by Muzio. Sure was in third spot, Jalabo fourth, Stump fifth, Uwe Raab sixth, and Sean Kelly again in there in seventh spot. And Poppel, having added to the four state successes he got in the Tour of Spain this year, was the victor, but this man still had the yellow jersey. Jeremy looking very happy with himself. That's confirmation of Van Poppel's success, and as far as he was concerned, it added to his already significant list. It was, in fact, Poppel's 66th victory. Jerry Marie now had a leader of send of 59 seconds on Abdul Jafroff. Kelly was in third place, one minute, four seconds down. Le Mans back, one seven. Well, the stage from Ardentin to Alessian was a time trial. This was going to cover some 73 kilometres. The riders setting off at uh, two minute intervals on this occasion. It was an undulating course and it was certainly going to cause some problems. This is uh, Eric, van, uh, Eric van der Arden going for it. And Van der Aden and Guy Noon is up behind him. Fignon was giving a great deal of thought to the ride ahead of him. There with his four spoke wheels and his special rally bicycle. Fignon, something of a specialist of this one, was beginning to pull in his two minute men. Fignon, also a teammate of Thierry Marie in the Castorama squad, was getting some good time checks on his own uh, team man, but on this, this occasion, Fignon was not going to finish in the top 10. In fact, he finished 16th overall, 3 minutes 39 seconds down. PDM are well known for their time trialing ability. This is Raul Alcala. And Goltz also coming along. Goltz was to finish in 13th spot, 3 minutes uh, 16 seconds down. Waiting for the start. And it's Delgado. Pedro Delgado was to finish in eighth place, two minutes and five seconds down on the ultimate victor. Delgado has been pulling his two minute man. That was Andy Hampston. Abdul Jafarov was the surprise of the day. The early time checks had been showing him way down the field. In fact, at the 49 kilometer point, he was lying in 10th spot. By the time they came to 63 kilometer spot, he'd moved up to 7th. And then right at the end, after 73 kilometers of racing, Abdul Jafarov had moved himself up the general classification uh, to finish in 6th spot. Melchor Mauri of the Spanish squad, might say seventh with Abdul Jafarov. Melka Mari was to take sixth spot at 1.33. Mari, winner of the Tour of Spain, had held yellow jersey on all by one day in the Tour of Spain, and he was beginning to show his time trialing ability. Gianni Bunya was moving very well indeed. He was to take fifth spot overall, one minute, 31 seconds down. Bunya had been consistent right the way through. He started back in seventh place and moved himself up bit by bit. Riding quite an unusual bicycle with a curved seat tube and a curved top tube. And with all these riders using the same trust and handlebars, modern technology making him go that much faster. This man is a specialist in time trials. Eric Brukink looked upon himself as being the number one, and soon he was before long. Brukink, at the 29 kilometre point, had gone through in 41.35 and was in fact in the lead. At the 49 kilometre point, again, he was still in the lead well ahead of Indran and Le Mans. 
Brooking, previous winner of time trials in the Tour de France, knew what he had to do, was pedalling quite smoothly. And even at 63 kilometre point, he was still in the lead at the time of 1.23.37. He was 20 seconds up on Indurain and 26 seconds up on Le Monde. But the man that was causing surprise of the day was really giving it some stick and surprised everybody by his fast riding. And this was uh, Jean-Francois Bernard. He'd already done well in the, in the prologue time trial. Now riding with the Benesto squad, Bernard was beginning to go extremely well and move up the list. He was to finish in third spot. A move of team seemed to suit Jean-Francois Bernard. And his time in the end was just some, 50, some 1 minute 14 seconds down, sorry, 53 seconds down on the uh, overall winner. Well, Le Mans knew what he had to do. Le Mans, a specialist at this sort of distance, when the 73 kilometre was covered two years ago in the time trial, Le Mans had run out winner. He started slowly, he was 26 seconds down on uh, Broeking at the first two time checks, one at 29 kilometres, one at 49 kilometres. But Broeking was really beginning to drop back. In fact, Broeking was going to finish fourth overall and he lost 1 minute 14 seconds on Indurain in the final 10 kilometres. And when Le Monde had gone through with 10 kilometres to go, there was only 8 seconds separating him from Broeking, and in the end, he was ahead of Broeking by 1 minute and 6 seconds. Broeking had faded, Le Monde had come good and come strong, and was going to finish in second spot, just 8 seconds down on Indurain. We're now looking at Miguel Indurain. He'd started earlier on down the field and had set the fastest time, which they're all aiming for. He put in a superb performance. His time for the day for the 73 kilometres is going to be one hour, 35 minutes and 44 seconds. The Benesto team were back with a bang. In fact, they were going to finish with Indurain in the first spot. Jean-François Bernard third overall in that uh, top ten was going to be Pedro Delgado as well in eighth spot. Indurain coming into the finish to the applause of the public set that very fast time at 135.44. That gave him the victory on the stage, but not the yellow jersey. He'd been well down on general classification, not having uh, been up with the early breaks. So Bernesto having the victory laurels there, but uh, Le Monde it was by virtue of his superb time trial that took the yellow jersey back off Thierry Marie. Marie not making the top ten. And there's confirmation of Le Monde in the lead by 1 minute 30 seconds over Broking, who'd faded badly in the time time. Abdul Japarov third. Kelly had dropped down as well as a result of that. He was suffering. Eurosport. The Tour de France. This program is brought to you by Eurosport in association with ESOSTAR, the fast acting isotonic thrust quencher. Eurosport. Hier auf der Chance de See ist das Ziel der Tour de France. Eurosport ist jeden Tag live dabei. Also and now with the next stage, nine stage from uh, Alençon, and the riders here setting off with <laughs> looks like Crofts on the side of the road. And oh, don't bite his head off. He's got his own little choice of rider here. And uh, also here advertising Coca Cola. Well, drink is for doggies. So the stage then, the riders now heading off after that uh, 73 kilometer. Not too many people anxious to uh, try on this stage, covering uh, from Alençon to Rennes, 161 kilometers. But Charlie Motte, always a character, will have a little go, was out on his own, but not for long. The rest of the pack then behind began to reel the bowl Charlie in. And it was Ab uh, Abadou who's next to go. Henri Abadou had had all sorts of misfortunes in the team time trial. When he punctured, uh, they couldn't get the door open for the mechanic to give him a spare wheel, so they passed it through the window. When they put it onto his bicycle, it didn't fit. So the mechanic finally got out the other door and tried to get his second bike off the roof. That was in the middle of the roof. It took an awful long time. Abadou not having the best of Tour de France. He's lost a lot of time. Conishave trying to pull back this one right at the front. Conishave catching up with Abadou on the descent. Conishev, silver medalist a couple of years ago in the World uh, Professional Road Championship, was going very well indeed. There, more damage for the Toshiba team because the knee of Aberdeen showing the sign of a crash. 
Toshiba, unfortunately, also having lost Marshall Gao in a crash, the misfortunes in the time trial, and the fact that their team sponsor has told them that they're not going to have any sponsorship as uh, for regards to Toshiba in 1992. They're withdrawing from uh, cycle racing. So the team is looking for a new sponsor and looking for an opportunity of showing themselves to uh, likely sponsors. So they had plenty of opportunity here because three men went up to join that breakaway. Jalabo was with them. Bongion was up there as well. Lelia joined up as well together with Bruniel and Bontempi. Konashev, the original man that caught Abadi, was with them. This is a useful group. Back in the main pack, Le Monde was busily talking to his team manager by a piece of new modern technology. There you can see a little microphone uh, in front of Le Monde's mouth. He's also got up in the helmet a transmitter and a receiver as well. These hard helmets make it possible for riders to have this technology rather than dropping to the back of the pack to hear what the team manager has to say. Going in towards the finish, Brunil tried to get the victory for Lotto. He eased himself off the front. There were three Toshibas in that pack behind him. Bontempi was there as well for the Carrera squad, Abadi, Lely and Conishave. But they were surprised because the RMO ride that nipped off the front was Ribeiro. He'd been sitting quietly in there and he was heading on in towards his seventh victory only as a professional. He's been pro for four years now and this is the first ever victory by a Brazilian rider in the Tour de France. He made it to the line, but Konishev was very close up alongside him. The main pack came thundering in. And in the line again, Dalam Jabdul Japarov, but he wasn't going to get this one. He was squeezed out in the sprint. So Ribeiro was the victor. Abdul Japarov could do no better this time than finish back in the pack. So there, Greg Lamont still in the yellow jersey. And yet another line to add to the selection that he's got to uh, take home for his young sons, Jeffrey and Scott, or to his daughter, Simone. And that's confirmation. Ribeiro, the first Brazilian to win a stage, just ahead of Jalabert Conishave. Le Monde now 1 minute 13 up on breaking. Abdul Japarov 1.15. But uh, during the day, it was obvious that the, uh, the PDM squad were not firing on all cylinders. On the 10th stage for Ran to Kimper, the riders set off and here Le Monde in the centre enjoying a joke. These are standard practices when they start. But already two of the PDM riders did not start. Uwe Aber did not start on the day, and nor did uh, Nico Verhoeven. They had lost two men before the race started. That was drama as far as the PDMs were concerned. And also the rest of the team were beginning to feel rather sick. This is Eric Bruking showing the signs of symptoms of some disease, and the rest of the riders begin to struggle off the back. Falk Bolden was now in desperate trouble, sweating profusely and lost all the power in his legs. National champion of Germany, this ex-amateur with some considerable experience in bike racing, had now lost all the power from his legs. Next to go was Martin Early. PDM were in all sorts of trouble. Van Poppel likewise was beginning to struggle too. Although Bowden was going to uh, go on to the finish, uh, Van Poppel was going to say enough and abandoned on this stage. Martin Early likewise. So the PDMs were now down to just four men in the pack and they weren't feeling too good either. And the Bretons out in fine form, going through Brittany, delightful countryside and wearing the traditional costume, watching this one man going on his own. It was Thierry Laurent. RMO doing quite well. Yesterday their rider won the stage, Ribeiro, and now Thierry Laurent was trying to do the same. But the pack weren't going to let him get away with it very much, and one of those sprints for the time bonus, it meant that Abdul Japarov collected yet another time bonus of six seconds, just ahead of Jan Muzio. So on this stage then, covering 208 kilometres, the rest of the pack will begin to splinter. Despite the effect of Jala to stay away from this lot, so Laurent to stay away from this lot, he was soon caught. And guess who had to go then? Kia Pucci. Kia Pucci had already stated he wouldn't uh, worry about anything. He was going to attack everybody and everything on the flat, on the mountains, but he hadn't done a particularly good time trial. He'd been disgusted with that. But still he was making the legs hurt of the rest of the pack. At least he caused the field to split, and another little group went up the front, and four men began to drive away. 
And these four men, Brian Holm, Miko Denise, Nico Emmons, and uh, Phil Anderson. Brian Holm having changed his name from Holm Sorensen, is quite a useful rider, being previous champion of uh, Denmark last year. Moving through, Nico Edmonds, about five successes last year, was looking for another one. And Phil Anderson. Already in fine form this year, Anderson was looking to add another stage victory to his already considerable list of successes. The peloton, though, was only 45 seconds behind, and they were being led up by the Lotto squad here with the pink uh, sleeves on their jerseys. Lotto were looking for a chance. Muzio had always been there or thereabouts, but hadn't really had any opportunity so far of getting a stage victory. So they start to go for this one. First man to go was Michel Denise, winner last year of the Kellogg's uh, Pro Tour of Britain. He went for a long one. Anderson was at the back and nearly got balked on his way through. Anderson moved across, though, to the left-hand side of the road. He could look back, they see he got this one well and truly stitched up and plenty of time to throw his hands in the air and win the stage. Behind him, the usual mad scramble for the line was going on. And who led them in? None other than the man in the green jersey, Jadamali Nabdu Japarov. With all the vital time seconds at bonus had gone, but points were useful as far as he's concerned to keep the green jersey. Phil Anderson scoring yet another success, and Greg Lamont still in the yellow jersey. Anderson just beating Edmonds to the line, home in third spot, Denise fourth, Abdu Japarov leading the pack in and beating Ludwig this time with Muzio back in seventh spot. Lamont now was just one minute nine seconds ahead of Abdu Japarov, who'd been quietly snipping at his heels, picking up those time bonuses. Eric Bruking at 1.13, Indurain in fourth spot, Barnard just behind them. Well, drama's going to happen on the, before the start of the 11th stage then, uh, from Camper to St. Heblame. Overnight, the doctor had been to look at the remaining PDM riders, and they did not start on next on the stage today. They had withdrawn from the race, and during the night, uh, they had had fevers, and uh, the fever that uh, in, that uh, Brooking had 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 been somewhere around about 38 degrees. All the rest of the riders had spent the night unable to sleep, sweating profusely, and there were no fit state to start the stage. They were being taken back in the team car to the airport and taken back to Holland. Early had gone back to Manchester, Sean Kelly had gone back to Ghent, and Alcala had gone back to his home in Geneva. And the race went on without them. A lot of consternation amongst the officials and journalists and everybody concerned as to why it was that so many men could suddenly be eliminated. The whole nine-man team of the PDM squad were now out of the race. None of these soigneurs or helpers uh, had in any way been affected by the mystery virus that had affected the, the riders, and there's a lot of interest in the medical results that were yet to come. But once in a while, the field were held up by a zebra crossing. Here the cows plenty of opportunity to munch the cud and look at the field go by. This stage was going very quickly indeed, 246 kilometres of whistling by. In fact, they were going to average at the end of the stage just over 47 kilometres per hour. That's a sniff under 30 miles an hour. Again, the Motorola team active in the bunch. But one by one, the riders began to get themselves up onto the front. We'd had a breakaway of some ten men. This breakaway to Volk, Jakobs, Kiefel, Vermoot, Van Slyke, Argentan, Pensek, Lavien, Van Orso and Mark Sargent had just about been caught when they reacted. Half the field caught half the breakaway, half the breakaway went away. They had a lead which at one time was two minutes. It dropped back to one minute and 20 seconds. And the only ones that survived were Vermoot, Van Slyke, Lavien and Van Orso. And up to them came one rider on his own, Ralph Yarman, hero of day one when he went to earn a lone break. This time he decided to leave his compatriots and try and get down to the finish to win the stage. The field closed down on the other four breakaways and Yarman now was some 25 seconds in the lead. But the field could see him going in towards the finish. And Greg LeMond was prominent as well over the uh, Loire River and right down there into the edge of Nantes to saint herblain the race has finished in Nantes no less than 27 times. In fact, in 1903, in the first Tour de France, it was a point where the riders stopped on that magnificent tour where they covered the whole of the 2,400 kilometres in six stages, averaging some 400 kilometres a day. That's 250 miles a day. How times have changed. Here, a useful little slipping away on the front, it was the RMO rider, Charlie Motte, that gave them the slip. The rest of the field, zigzagging from one side of the road to the other, didn't know how to close the gap on the bold Charlie who had gone for a long one. 
and he managed to keep ahead of the pack coming up the finishing straight. It goes uphill, that suits Charlie Motti. Already this year he's won the Classic Days Alps and last year he won a stage in the Tour de France for the first time. Previously he used to try and win the race overall, not bother about stage victories. Now he's decided to go for the glory of stage success and he managed to keep ahead of the rest of the pack over the line and right behind him, Abdul Japarov yet again tried to wipe out the right up alongside him and that was Muzio. So Abdul Japarov though pushed back into third place this time as Charlie Motti savoured the success of being first across the line at Santa Blaine. Still then the yellow jersey on the shoulders of Greg LeMond that was the result of yesterday that is the position and today is the day off. The riders have gone all the way down to Pau by aeroplane except one rider one man has failed to catch the aeroplane. Er Zimmerman has been kicked out of the Tour de France by the organisation join us again tomorrow for action on the stage from Pau goodbye Eurosport the Tour de France this programme is brought to you by Eurosport in association with East